All right, well, we'll get started so you're not here more than a couple minutes late. Oh, that's dangerous. Okay, so this is the last lecture for a day. This is lecture three. So if we look at the title, what we're really going to do is look at some measurement resolution and challenge. Remember, day one, we've been sort of setting the stage for a lot of these diagnostics. And what now we want to talk about is that now we're really focusing on the fact that these are going to be in turbulent environments, turbulent combustion environments, and there are some challenges that certainly come in these environments. So the goal of this lecture is to provide a background in measurements specifically in turbulent systems. We're going to give a quick description of combustion in turbulent environments so that you have an idea of the challenges that we're dealing with. We'll talk about experimental resolution and limitations. Again, hopefully some of this is stuff that you've never seen in, from the context of it's kind of the dirty laundry that no one really wants to talk about. So let's talk about some of the problems with some of the te techniques. We're always going to have this kind of challenge and this balance between turbulence length and time scales and the resolution of our measurements. Uh, requirements for quote unquote good measurements. And um, okay, so before we get started, how many of you have not taken a combustion course? Okay, that's all right. How many of you have not taken a turbulence course? Okay, so that one's even better. All right. So, how many of you? Hold on, I'm keep cross questing. This is uh, how many of you that are have not taken a turbulence course but are working in turbulent combustion? Okay, so these are all right. That's good. All right, so let's talk about uh, combustion and turbulence real quick. So combustion, I say many of you are familiar with this. It sounds like most of you took, took combustion courses. So really, there's no need to describe what it is, but what I want to kind of emphasize is that many times we write combustion as this. Uh, fuel plus oxidizer are going to product. Okay, Kind of very nice, neat situation. But in essence, it really looks something like this. Okay, it has complicated uh, kinetic pathways, low temperature, high temperature, different types of formation, NOx, soot, etc. Even your most simple fuels, such as methane, even when we take a kinetic model, they're described with 50, 60, 70 species, hundreds of reactions as you move to complex hydrocarbons, hundreds, thousands of species, hundreds, thousands of reactions, okay? And really what this should kind of set us up is that there's many, many, many things that we can't measure. There's also beyond that, there's many things that are interacting that influence the outcome of what we do measure, okay? And this is just from the combustion side. So again, we can look from a laminar flame to kind of take an idea of what's going to exist in maybe a small regime. This is really what the structure looks like for a laminar flame we end up with a lot of these species confined to very small spaces, okay? So there's many more species than we can measure. The spatial distributions and the heat release rate, two quantities that we really want in these environments, they may be confined to very small regions, and these may be regions that we can't actually resolve, okay? Or they define the scales that we should resolve, okay? So again, it starts to set that we have a pretty complicated task ahead of us is that at best we're going to measure two or three things, a very sparse representation of, of the real picture. Okay. So in turbulent flows, let's look at more of a challenge. Okay, those of you that haven't taken turbulence, I'll try to make this kind of as straightforward as I can. Turbulent flows are highly transient, three-dimensional, and we'll come back and I'll show a little bit more detail on turbulence in a minute. And when we couple it to a set of chemical reactions, we create a very complex system, okay, occurring on multiple length and time scales. Just uh, from sort of the fluid mechanics point of view, we can have something that's called the outer scales, and this is really where the energy is extracted from the mean flow and input into the turbulence. We have kind of the largest scales, which are the integral scales, all the way down to the smaller scales, the Kolmogorov scales. And whether or not this is accurate now, what this is depicting that we have length scales that range a couple orders of magnitude, okay? We have decades, okay? We may have a factor of 1,000 between the largest length scales and the smallest length scales. And the exact same thing for the time scales, okay? So we start thinking about turbulence, the thing we'll get from here. 
large dynamic range length and time scales. Okay, well, let's imprint that. Now, when we introduce a combustion process, let's say a flame, we can have many different uh, regimes. We can have cases where the flames are thin compared to the turbulent eddies, such that the eddies can only kind of wrinkle and kind of move it around. Or we can have a situation where the flames are large compared to the eddies and the turbulence can actually penetrate the flames, kind of actually get into its internal structure. For both of these cases, okay, we have to really start thinking as there is a complicated multi-length uh, scale, multi-scale interaction between the flames, between the combustion process, which is kind of chemical kinetics and heat release, and turbulence. So this creates a challenge if our flames start to be on the order of the smallest turbulent length scales. Again, I'll, I'll show you some ideas, but these may be tens of microns, okay? Again, depending on kind of your Reynolds number, we'll show how they scale with Reynolds number in a minute. They can be very small. And then, so you can say, okay, what if we just zoom, zoom in? That's fine. We possibly can do that. But then we don't have enough bandwidth on the other end, if you will. We don't have enough uh, dynamic range to look at the larger length scales who are controlling the large scale dynamics, which controls the whole process to start with. Okay? So all I'm pointing out is that we have this significant multi-scale problem in turbulence. Okay? And you actually, when you add combustion, combustion actually can create new length scales. Okay? And we'll talk about this. So again, let's look again more at a, at a scientific challenge. If we look at, even at an atmosphere, the reaction zones can be on the order of the thickness of a human hair. Okay? And they scale, they inversely with pressure. So as we go to higher pressures, they get even narrower. So you're starting to think, wow, that's kind of tough already at an atmosphere where we do a lot of our measurements. So if we want to go to pressure, things get really thin. The time scales, I worked really hard. This is timed approximately correct. So these cycles, which is which are, where we're not resolving anything, I don't think anyone would argue we're resolving anything in this. We just can just see the macroscopic motion. And these are much faster than a blink of an eye, okay? So again, we have these extremely small time scales, short time scales, small spatial scales, fast time scales. That's the challenge, that's the environment that, that we're working in. So now we need to talk about, with those in the back of mind, all our different types of resolution, okay? So let's talk about optical resolution first, okay? We're going to talk about the resolutions between just what kind of the laser and the laser and the optics and then the camera because all of these play their own integral part in the resolution. So let's talk about first the focusing property of the laser beam and they're related to the mode stru structure of the beam. So again, we talked a little bit about a plane wave. That's what we did the solution before. Let's say we have an infinite plane wave. Only one uh, TM mode it exists. And what we mean by mode is this is the intensity distribution. And so a single mode TM has a Gaussian intensity distribution and can be considered diffraction limited. And we'll, we'll discuss this more in a minute. So what we have here is if we look at a, 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 your best mode, a TM mode, with a Gaussian distribution, this is essentially if you take a cut across the beam, slice across the beam, this is what it would look like. Okay. We have some I naught, which is the peak, and then this is how it scales. This is in R, but this is in X, Y, and Cartesian coordinates. Where W is the, is essentially can be considered the beam waste. Okay, that's where uh, the I over I naught is dropped to 1 over E squared. So if we have a great beam, that's a TM00 beam. I'll show you what bad beams look like. But if you have a great beam, you get this nice Gaussian distribution. Okay, let's, let's keep that for right now. Now, we have this beam that has this really wonderful Gaussian distribution. So we're starting right now with a TM00, our best beam we have, okay? Now we're going to focus that. A minimum waste will appear. That's W0. And then if I look across any point, okay, and let's say I had some lens over here. We'll talk about it in a second. But I had some beam, and then it hits the lens, and now it's converging. It's focused to its point, and then it goes back, okay? At any position in the Z, the propagating direction, uh, the beam waste, uh, Wz, can be determined via this equation, okay? Where we have our minimum waste, we have z, which is the direction, and z sub r is what's referred to as the Rayleigh range, and it's defined as the distance along the beam 
uh, from the focus to where w is square root times uh, the minimum distance. It's basically the Rayleigh range gives you a characteristic of where the beam is in focus because obviously the minimum focus only occurs at one particular point, but we need some spatial region where we would say the beam is relatively focused. So we typically use the Rayleigh range. Okay? So there's the definition of the, of the Rayleigh range. Okay? So let's actually define uh, how we get this minimum distance. Let's first by determining the spreading angle of the beam. Again, right now we haven't worried about how we focused it, we're just saying we focused it right now. Okay? So we have a Gaussian beam, and let's say z is much, much greater than zr, so we can invoke a small angle approximation. This divergence angle just comes from geometry, it looks like a triangle, and then we take the limit z go to zero. It can be manipulated such that you get this expression here using uh, the equations from the previous page, and you get the, uh, the Angular spread is just two times the wavelength, pi over w naught. Okay. Now the spreading angle can also be approximated uh, as the inverse of the f number. If you think about it, I have a diameter beam of d. I focus it down over some distance f that will come to its minimum. If we zoom back out and say it comes to an infinite point, that's just a triangle, right? And then invoking the small angle approximation. So you can combine these, and you can say that the waist uh, radius or the waist diameter actually is just 4 times lambda times the focal length over pi over d, where d here is the original size of the beam before you focused it. Okay? So we have an equation that's now relating our original d, our original diameter, the focal length, the wavelength, and the, at its waist. Now let's talk about some problems or stuff that we start to deviate from this. So we typically model laser as a plane wave with infinite lateral extent. This is not possible in a real cavity because real cavity actually has finite mirror spacing. It has finite mirror size. You end up with defects in the mirrors. And all of that, all those imperfections lead within a resonator leads to beam diffraction, distortion, and losses. Okay? All you have to do is things aren't perfect. We don't get an infinite. And these can generate higher order transverse waves. These, can be, these are different TM modes. TM is zero, zero is your Gaussian mode. And a lot of your beams, your fundamental out of your scientific lasers will look like this, right? If you've ever looked at your, your IR or your green from your YAG, whatever, you, or you have a nice CWA, you look at it, it looks like that. Now, I will say you start to see things that do look like this as you go to higher harmonics and do more and more uh, frequency processes on them, okay? These are very complicated. We're not even going to talk about these. These are superposition of Hermite Gaussian modes. and can describe a Hermite polynomial. That's not important right now. But the point is that you can get these really strange-looking beams. And why do we care about that? Is that the existence of higher-order modes, which we call multimode beams, lead to higher beam divergence and poorer focusing, okay? So multimode beams are characterized with an m-squared value, and m-squared increases for an increasing number of modes. So for a perfect Gaussian beam, we have m-squared is equal to 1. So our new definition of our beam parameters from our focus beam and our Rayleigh range now has this m-squared quantity. So we're fine if m-squared is equal to 1, right? If we have a scientific, a really good laser that has an m-squared of 1, we're fine. And that's what we typically have like in a Q-switch JAG. But if you're using like an industrial laser, like high repetition type rate laser, they can have M squares as high as 10 or 100, okay? Pretty bad beam properties. Dye laser output, which again, if we need to get to PLIF or you need to do UV generation, have M squares that are typically 2, 4, 5, 6. So they can impact your ability to focus the beam, okay? Now, if you look at these equations, what they show is that you can get, to get this as small as possible, you can be achieved by using a short focal length, right? So this becomes small if this focal length is small, right? But, or, or increasing D. But as D gets big, or your focal length gets short, you know, you end up decreasing the Rayleigh range, okay? And so you can go back to the previous equation. So just to recap, if I want to focus my beam as small as possible, what I do is I make my beam really big before I focus it, as big as possible, and I put it through a short focal length lens, and that thing will slam down really. 
The problem is your Rayleigh range is also tiny. So then it also just goes back really big very quickly, okay? And so you always have this balance between the achievable site focal spot and the Rayleigh range, right? Because think about an image, and we're thinking about a sheet thickness, which is just the analog, it's just the analog in 2D, is that we want it to be in focus over our entire field of view, right? Not just at one point. And so we can't just slam everything down and get it this great focus right in the middle and everything, everything else out of focus. So keep that in mind. You have this kind of balance. This is what I was saying in planar imaging. The laser beam is formed into a sheet. But a sheet, uh, usually you do it with a cylindrical lens and then a spherical lens. Since the optics only expand the beam in one direction, the laser sheet thickness is essentially the same as the spot size given in 30, 33. So the same uh, equations you use to get the focal length of like a, a beam being focused to a spherical lens, you can get as the sheet thickness being, being uh, narrowed during a spherical lens. So let's look at an example. Let's say we have a pulse JAG 532, original D, and we put it through a focal length of 500 millimeter. If we have an M squared, we end up seeing D naught is equal to 34 microns. Well, this looks pretty good. These are actual kind of numbers you would use in the lab, right? You go in, you have a 10 millimeter beam, and we put it through a focal length of 500 millimeter, and then you calculate this, um, and then you come and tell me, yeah, we have 34 micron resolution. That's great, except I'll tell you you're wrong, and this is why. We've neglected the fact that the incident beam has divergence. And this, no matter what laser you have, it has divergence, okay? And thus, by, it has a, an effective M squared greater than 1, okay? So the way that you, if you knew the M squared, you could just go back to equation 33, our equation we just derived and say, okay, what is actually the focal spot size? But we don't, we don't really know that. Normally, we only get the divergence. Like you buy a YAG. The manual tells you what the divergence of the laser, 0.5 milliradian, something, whatever it is. You're, they, they give it, they give it to you. So then what you can do um, is actually determine what your focal spot size is going to be. So if the actual beam diameter measured at a distance f, which is the focal lens, is related through the divergence angle just through this expression, just geometry. So our divergence angle, which is given as your spec, is... Uh, tangent 1 df over f, okay? So with small angle approximation, then the focus beam diameter or the laser sheet thickness is now calculated in this manner. And if we go back to our example, if we have divergence of about 0.5 milliradians, you get a focus size of about 250 micron, which is about right. If you think about that from what you read or what you, if you go ahead and measure, that's not out of the ballpark. That's about what you could get. So you're already saying, okay, this is much worse than what I should be able to get. Uh, a laser doesn't have divergence. Sorry, this is kind of what you get. And so you, you, have, to, you have to work really hard to get um, very small focal size or very narrow sheet thicknesses because of divergence and other uh, parts, uh, other um, imperfections in your laser. And this is really important for those of you who do like PLIF and where you the UV, where the lasers not only have divergence, but they also have M squares much greater than one. Sometimes it's very difficult to get something better than half a millimeter, okay? And so this is, this is a, a challenge, okay? You can determine effective M squared from, from this equation by just saying, okay, the DF over D naught where M squared was equal to one. So that's kind of the beam optical resolution. Let's look at camera resolution. So we'll go back to our camera array. One of the things that my, kind of my soapbox is, again, hopefully you'll get out of this class, is that unfortunately it's common to find that the spatial resolution of a measurement, the in-plane spatial resolution is commonly reported as the projected area onto a pixel. So let me explain. Let's say you have a 10 micron pixel and you have magnification to 0.5. The projected area is 20 micron. It is very common in the literature for someone to write, we have 20 micron spatial resolution. This is absolutely not the case, okay? So look, you get capital, capital letters. This is not the spatial resolution. The spatial resolution I'm kind by saying can be much worse, it is much worse, okay? And let me explain. It depends on the ability of the camera to take an infinitesimal point of light 
and, and translate that. Well, let me, let me say it again. It's related to the point spread function. And what that means is that's the ability of it to take an infinitesimally small point light and how it, re, uh, how it remanifests or how it manifests itself onto the sensor. It gets blurred, okay? So the actual special resolution of a detector is the point, is the convolution of the point spread function and the actual emitted intensity distribution. So it's going to be a convolution of the point spread function and the projected pixel size, okay? So the point spread function describes the response of a system to an infinitely small object, okay? So even a diffraction limited system, so this is the best a system to do is diffraction limited, okay? And we'll talk about this, we, 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 we can't even do diffraction limited. But diffraction uh, will blur any point light object to a certain minimal size and shape, okay? And real systems are worse. So, but even the best thing we can do is diffraction limited, which gives us an airy disk, okay? So the point spread function uh, is a three-dimensional diffraction pattern, but the size of the blur spot is given by an airy disk. So what this means is if I have an infinitesimally point of, uh, point of light and I image that, I'm going to get a spot on my sensor. And if I have the best optical and best camera system ever made such that it was diffraction limited, it would still show up as, a, as an airy disk, okay? And so here's kind of an example. Uh, I show it just in comparison to the projected pixel area. This is a 532 nanometer laser, 7 micron camera pixel. The dashed line is what, for these different magnifications, what would be the, uh, the projected pixel. And then this would be the compounded. I, I don't show the, the addition of it, but I just show these would be additional blurring, okay, due to the spot size, okay? So it's not, it's not like you get this instead of the dashed line. You get the dashed line plus an effect of all of these blur spot size. And what you can see here is that when the magnification is one and you have a very large F number, you actually get a very large uh, blur spot size uh, just even if you were down at magnification one. So this would, you would end up having, instead of having a resolution of 10, or sorry, seven microns, you would have something that ends up being, you know, 65 by the time you convolve those together. So again, just keep idea that you, your system blurs uh, the, the, the response. Now, what happens is it gets even worse because all your optical system, your camera, everything else is, has aberrations and not perfect optical systems, and then you get even much worse than the diffraction limited blur spot size. Okay? So really what we need to do is what we, the, the, you need to measure the resolution of your system. So the way you do that is you would want to measure the point spread function. So let's say you could directly image it. You get an infinitesimally small point of light, put a pinhole in something, back illuminate it, and directly image it. Well, that's difficult because quantization of the image makes it difficult to determine. Like, I don't know exactly how you would measure that. It's a little difficult. Uh, high resolution imaging and biological sciences do type of things. They like say, okay, we know it's Gaussian or we assume it's Gaussian. They fit models and then they back out what the point spread function is. But actually, it's easier to consider something called the line spread function, which is really the 1D analog of it, or, or that you integrate in one direction, right? If you have the point spread function, you integrate over Y, you end up with the line spread function. And this is something we can directly measure, okay? And it's fine. It really, think about point spread functions and gives you the two-dimensional blur spies. The, the line spread function gives us information one dimension, and assuming that we don't have some kind of weird optical system, it's probably the same in Y as it is in X, okay? Okay, so it's a 1D surrogate, and it'll give you the width of the blur spot in one dimension. So how do we determine it? Well, we, we measure something called the step, step response function, also called the edge spread, edge spread function, okay? So this is a uh, Clemens 2000, the, that paper flow imaging offers a great experimental setup. You essentially... If you think about it, so you, you have a diffusing screen, you have a, a, a lamp, uh, you can have a filter, or you can have a uniform light source, like in my lab we use an integrating sphere. And what you do is you're collecting light, and you start to scan the, the knife edge across, and you monitor the signal for one pixel. You can do it for every one, but imagine one signal. As the knife edge is far away, you're going to collect a certain amount of light, and now as the edge gets closer and closer, that light's going to eventually go down, and you start to cut off the light going onto that one pixel. So that's what it looks like here. 
as the distance, uh, as we close the distance, we're measuring, uh, we're measuring 1, 1, 1, and then all of a sudden we're cutting off part of the light as we translate that. So eventually we're blocking all the light, okay? And then what you do is just take the derivative. Typically the best thing to just fit this to an error function. It's the smart way to do it because taking derivatives of discrete data is a pain. So fit it and then uh, take the derivative. And what this allows you to do is to end up determining experimentally what the blur spot size of your optical system is. And this is, if I had an opinion, I'd say every experimenter should do this with their setup. You should not just assume what it is. Because the results are actually quite surprising at times, how bad your system, I'll show you some of our results. But here, this is the idea if you had an infinite, uh, a perfect system, this is what your edge spread function would look like, right? Infinitesimal spike, I get line spread function, my infinitesimal, uh, infinitesimally thin blur spot size. But a real function, you get a finite blur spot. Don't worry about the MTF right now. We're, we're not going to talk about that. But right now, we're just saying that the blur spot size increases. Okay. Before you come back to measuring that, let's quickly touch on the outer plane resolution. Well, the outer plane resolution is likely determined by your laser sheet thickness, right? So the, but the, the laser sheet thickness can actually influence the in-plane spatial resolution if the laser sheet thickness is greater than the depth of field. So if your depth of field is narrower than your laser sheet thickness, then what happens is the wings of the laser sheet in the out-of-plane dimension aren't in focus, and they actually mess up your interpretation of the in-plane measurement. Okay? So what we need to do is make sure that the depth of field of our camera lens, the mount that we can focus in the out-of-plane direction, is larger than the laser sheet thickness. So there's the equation for the depth of field, or the depth of focus, sorry, uh, depth of field also, two times the blur size, the F number, and M plus one over M. Okay, so let's look at an example. Uh, again, magnification of 0.5, F number of 1.4. If we have diffraction limited spot size, our depth of focus is 30 micron. That's really bad. I mean, really tough to deal with. It's not that it's bad. It's neither good nor bad. It's what it is. But there's no way you're going to get a laser sheet thinner than 30 microns. Okay? You just don't. Now, if you actually, your system has a blur spot size of 50 microns, which is probably more realistic, then your depth of focus is 420 microns. Your laser sheet, you can get it less than that, and you're fine. What we're really trying to make sure is that your laser sheet thickness does not influence your measurement in plane. Okay? These are all the type of things that you maybe haven't thought about before in, in your measurement. Okay? So the idea is that when the depth of focus is less than the laser sheet thickness, the wings of the laser sheet are not in focus, and it actually significantly degrades the measurements. Since you can imagine, even a 2D image with a really thin sheet, the image is still integrated over the depth of the laser sheet. Okay? And since these now wings are out of focus, both in and out, they end up blurring your actual in-plane image. Okay? So really, you have to have, again, this is another kind of note of caution, you need a careful balance between choosing the F number, M, and the focal number uh, in your experiment. Okay, two other camera parameters that are important, signal to noise ratio and dynamic range. Earlier we introduced this equation for signal collection in terms of photons. We went over this. Now, the collected signal, uh, let's call it in photoelectron units, can actually be written uh, in terms of the number of photons per pixel times a camera quantum efficiency and a gain. Well, if we have a CCD, we have gain of one. So really what we have is the quantum efficiency is how can we, con what is the efficiency in which we convert these photons per pixel to an actual charge, okay? So this is kind of, again, the transfer function on the back end, okay? So if we have an ICCD, gain will be anywhere from 1 to 1,000, okay? Okay, now we want to consider noise sources. So we're only going to consider two noise sources, shot noise and read noise. Even though I will admit for an ICCD, you actually have uh, another noise source called spurious noise that comes from just the intensified process itself. But for simplicity, let's just consider two uh, noise sources. Okay? Shot noise okay, refers to the statistical fluctuations in the number of photoelectrons generated at each pixel. So 
This is not the same as the uncertainty when I tell about ICCD. Even for a CCD, when we talked about, remember, photons come in, they hit the silicone, they eject photoelectrons. But what happens is every photon does not arrive at the exact same time, right? That, that would be convenient, but ridiculous, right? So since they arrive randomly, right, there is a statistical distribution of how the photoelectrons are ejected. Okay, due to the sensitivity of the material, just due to the photoelectric effect. So what happens is because they're, they're randomly arrive, arriving, basically you can imagine since they have a distribution of the way they arrive, there has to be a distribution of the way the photoelectrons are generated on the back end. Okay, so, so the statistical fluctuations of the photoelectrons exhibit Poisson statistics, but we know for the large number of events, in this case photons, the statistics can be approximated as Gaussian. So then the shot noise, this is just the statistical uh, nature, uh, flux RMS of photoelectrons, or electrons here is given as the square root of, of this factor. Okay, and where K is another noise factor, that's, this is where I've lumped that spurious noise in, in there, uh, is a noise factor that quantifies the noise generated through the gain process. Again, if we don't have gain, k is just equal 1, and we have just the square root of the efficiency times SPP, uh, and that's it. But now we have gains higher than 1, and k is higher than 1 for ICCD. That's shot noise. Read noise occurs now on the back end. We've already, let's see, we've collected our photons, we've generated photoelectrons, we store them as charge, but now we need to read them out, okay? And this is the A to D conversion part, and the way we have to do this is amplification and digitization, and there is uncertainty that comes in this, right? Any A to D process has, has uncertainty, okay? So, if we assume that these noise sources are uncorrelated, then the signal-to-noise ratio can be written in this manner. So, we obviously, we have our number of signal and photoelectrons, and then we have our read noise, which we'll just call, we have the sum of the squares of a read noise and shot noise. Okay, for the majority of imaging cases, we operate in shot noise limited operation. That means the read noise is much less than the shot noise, okay? This occurs for either high signal levels or cameras with very low read noise, very good scientific CCDs. Shot noise limited operation can also occur for noisy ICCD cameras. You can think about the case. If you look at this, um, if G is increased such that the shot noise term dominates the read noise term, since the signal increases as G and the noise, oh, should not be a squared here. Let me, that's a, that's a mistake. This should be G, so you can mark that one out. I'll fix that one in mine. Uh, this should go, this goes as the square root of G, okay? Should make sense because there was, there should just be a G multiplied by those, okay? Everything else is correct. So, since the signal is going as G, but the noise goes as G to the one half, the overall signal and signal noise increase as well, okay? So, what you can imagine is even though this is kind of, it's conceptual, it's kind of when the first time I thought about this, it bothered me is that when I have an ICCD, what I want to do, we know that for those of you, as you crank up the gain, it gets noisier. But you actually want to crank up the gain so, in this so that you actually are operating in shot noise limited regime. Your signal noise actually will go up. Even though your apparent noise that you're seeing is going up, the actual signal to noise ratio is going up. Okay. Okay, now our important consideration, remember we're thinking in the context of turbulent combustion research for the purposes of this lecture, is signal noise. The my next point, the same as my, we need to measure uh, the, uh, the resolution or system and we don't use the projected pixel as our resolution. Soapbox point number two is signal noise is not the signal to background ratio. The quality of your measurement, do not take the peak signal and just divide it by the background noise of your camera. So don't take like a plif signal and then put the lens cap on and get the noise in the background say this is my signal noise of 200. That's not, that's not, and that's done very often. So the benefit of having like the next generation is I can hopefully impart to you some better practices versus commonly a lot what that, that's done in the literature. So again, signal to noise, you, you can't do this. So what do we want as a signal noise? The best definition, I think, of signal noise in, in a context of a turbulence measurement is 
uh, the mean signal over the standard de deviation of signal measured in a uniform region. Okay? That is a, is a good measure of the signal noise. Okay? And it, what it is is signal noise is a measurement, is a measure, it's a metric of measurement precision, not accuracy. It will tell you how precise your single shot measurements will be in a turbulent combustion environment. Okay? Now, we, can, we, we all know the old adage, you can be precisely wrong, right? But, you know, you could be imprecisely accurate. But this tells you precision. Uh, and, so, and that's what we really want is a level of repeatability in, in, in turbulence measurement. Okay. Dynamic range, this refers to the ratio between the maximum and minimal usable, minimum usable signal. So your maximum signal is typically referred to as the saturation level. So think about this, you have a camera, you have 12 bits, 4096 is where it saturates, right? So the saturation level is limited by the total number of photoelectrons that can be stored in a CCD uh, pixel. Okay, that's the weld depth, that's how much charge it can hold. So we can say the minimal usable signal is limited by camera noise, that's fair, that's the floor, we'll say that's the floor. And hence the dynamic range can be defined in this way. So we have our saturated signal minus the integrated dark charge, okay, and, and over the, uh, the read noise, okay? So we'll say the read noise is the minimal usable signal, okay? Uh, and then we have this dark, dark charge. And the dark charge is just the amount that accumulates over integration, but mostly for uh, measurements where we're taking measurements over a fraction of seconds, this is, so negligible. I mean, dark charge really comes important when you're integrating over long amounts of time, okay? So this is typically negligible for short-gated experiments. So again, as an example, let's say we have a camera. This is pretty normal CCD, 12-bit uh, uh, CCD that has a weld depth of about 10 to the 5 electrons, has an, a conversion of 24.4 electrons per count, uh, and a read noise of 40 electrons RMS. These are, this actually, I took this off. I, I can't remember exactly, but I actually took this off of a, a, a pretty comparable off of an existing camera. What is the dynamic range? Well, if we go through and assume that the uh, dark charge is negligible, you get a dynamic range of 2,500. And then if that's converted to bits, it's actually 11.3 bits. Well, that sounds not too bad, but this camera is actually listed as a 12-bit camera due to its weld depth, but you're actually losing 0.7 bits of dynamic range due to noise, okay? So the worse the camera is, the actual you're losing levels due to noise. You're losing your dynamic range. I, like again, uh, CMOS camera is a great example. Uh, you know, 12, 15 years ago when the very first high-speed cameras co were coming out, they were 12-bit cameras because they could go from 0 to 40, 96 counts. But because of the noise, they were really like 10, 10 and a half bit cameras, which really is not very good. It really greatly limits your, your dynamic range. So instead of having 0 to 40, 96, you really, if you think about 10-bit, you have like 0 to 1,000 counts that's usable. Okay? Because, so noise really limits your dynamic range. Okay, now let's look a little bit at resolution requirements. We've discussed hardware spatial resolution in terms of what you can achieve with laser and signal collection. Well, let's talk about what we should be striving for, and this is the last uh, topic in this lecture. And this kind of will set you up kind of combining the hardware, our laser cameras, now with actually what the physics are giving us, what the fluid mechanics and what the chemistry is giving us. So general rule, better spatial resolution, we get lower signal noise and lower accuracy and precision. So there's a careful balance between our ability to resolve certain features and our ability to do it with high fidelity, okay? So now when we're gonna talk about temporal resolution, I'll be referring to acquisition rate, so sampling frequency. If you see I have an asterisk, for laser-based measurements, the temporal pulse widths are typically so much shorter than the flow uh, times that they're freezing the flow. Right? So we don't really have to worry about uh, the resolution there. Okay. Okay. So you now are equipped with some of the issues that, ex that limit experimental resolution. 
So that means knowing this, you go into a problem now, you'll go in with two levels of resolution. A desired resolution, which I'm going to tell you that's what we're going to do next, based on the turbulence and the combustion process. What is it that we really want to target? And the actual resolution, and that's what's combined to all the things we've already talked about. There's what you can get, that's your actual resolution, and you have what we should be targeting. And we'll see how those two intersect. All right, so what resolution do we need? to achieve in turbulent combustion research? Well, there's no one answer, but let's take a, take, take a look about at uh, turbulent flows and try to understand what sets these length and time scale. Okay. All right, now back to flow turbulence. Again, many of you have not had a turbulence course, so let's go a little bit more into detail of what happens. So those of you that have had it, or even those who have it, or may be familiar with the energy cascade. You may have seen this picture before. This is kind of a classic turbulence viewpoint. These, these are kind of written in terms of wave number space. Think about this as a spatial frequency. So low, but large length scales, small length scales. The way that turbulence classically work from a purely dissipative uh, viewpoint is that energy is supplied at these large outer scales. So mean flow energy is extracted from the mean flow. You have energy input, right? And then your largest characteristic scales is kind of are these integral scales. And you can think about these loose as the size of the largest eddies, the largest turbulent motion, okay, largest vortices, if you will. And then to a whole bunch of nonlinear interactions, stretching and folding. That's actually as they, they get stretched, they get folded. You have this kind of nonlinear interaction. They split to smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller eddies. At some point, they become small enough to where laminar processes, they can be dissipated through viscosity in their uh, diffused away, dissipated into heat. Okay? So that's how the classic cascade works. So in terms of turbulent length scales, you have these integral scales. You have something called the inertial subrange that describes the energy cascade. And then you have the Kolmogorov scale, which is the, the smallest turbulent length scale. Okay? So you can see we have a range of scales that's going to be, in our terms of our turbulent scales, inner scales to Kolmogorov scales, and from geometric scales, outer scales to Kolmogorov length scales. This is the definition of the Kolmogorov scale just on pure dimensional reasoning. And then we have our smallest scale for scalar fluctuations. That's essentially the Kolmogorov scale times the Schmidt number. And the Schmidt number is the ratio of the viscosity over molecular diffusion or mass diffusivity. For gases, Schmidt number is order one maybe 0.7 to 1.2, depending on what the gas is, uh, but it's order one. For liquids, it's order 1,000. Okay? So that already can sit up. That's a whole turbulence conversation. But for gases, the, the Batcher and the Kolmogorov scale are normally the same, so that means scalar fluctuations are dissipated at the same scale as the velocity fluctuation. But for liquids, that's not true. The scalar is much, much smaller in scale than the velocity fluctuation. Okay. So let's define the range of scales. Again, within this initial, this, uh, this uh, energy cascade, the energy dissipation, dissipation is constant. Okay? Let's not worry about where these come from. This is kind of units, but these are, this is the velocity squared at any scale within this cast inertial subrange over a time scale. But what we want to get to is at the end of the day, if we do all our right scaling, Go through and look at it and then come ask me break uh, um, tomorrow. If you do all your appropriate scaling, you can find that the ratio of the Kolmogorov scale to the integral scale scales as the turbulence Reynolds number to the minus three quarters. Or flip this around, the integral scale to the Kolmogorov scale is Reynolds number to the three quarters. Okay? And so we can also say, well, let's look at it a little bit broader. If if we have no energy transfer in this uh, inertial subrange, that means whatever I put in at the large scale has to be dissipated. So that's, we typically spend a little bit longer than in a turbulence course. But we put all that together, and you get the ratio of your outer scale to your Kolmogorov scale goes as the outer scale Reynolds number to three quarters, where the outer scale Reynolds number is just uh, the outer scale, okay, the mean velocity over kinematic viscosity. Why, do, why did I spend the time talking about this? Well, from flow point of view, there is a continuous spectrum of scales that scales as Reynolds number to the minus three quarters. Well, what if the Reynolds number is 10,000, 100,000? That's turbulence. Then that means there's a tremendous 
dynamic range between the smallest scale and the large scales. Okay? Not only do we have a dynamic range issue here because of the Reynolds number scaling, but what you can see here is that, let's say this outer scale is fixed due to the geometry. As I crank up the Reynolds number, that means that this Kolmogorovsky has to get really small. That's going to become very difficult to resolve. Okay? So as an example, let's take a jet or shear flow. Uh, a delta is usually the full width max hat, the full width at half. Uh, full width 5 to 95%, sorry, of the velocity profile. Let's say we're dealing with a jet. Measurements have shown that the C is this uh, um, kind of number. And you can kind of back out what the Reynolds number, sorry, what the ratio between the outer scale and the Kolmogorov scale would have to be. Okay? And, it, and some of them are kind of illuminating. Now, there have been a, many studies that showed kind of what the required measurements are. There's been measurements in uh, non premixed flames uh, out of Texas that suggested, depending on if you want to resolve 90% of the scalar variance, measurement should resolve 37 times the Batcher scale. So think about this, the Kolmogorov scale. That's, real, that's good. We can typically achieve that. That's not bad. 37 times that's pretty big. Now, if we want to get 90% of the dissipation energy, we have to get much smaller, nine times. Okay, so let's see how that falls out in a little bit. But before that, then I should say, okay, this recommendation is not law. Other researchers have said, no, you have to be much more stringent. So there's no real guide here, but your, your resolution is on the order at best about a, 10 times the smallest length scale if we want to resolve a lot of the energy processes. Okay. Now, we should also note that resolving or not resolving is not so simple. And that's tough to take at 525. But what happens is that as the scales get finer and finer, they'll be affected more and more by the imaging system that you're not really resolving well. I remember I said that MTF, I said don't pay any attention to that. Well, what happens is what that MTF shows is that as the cycle frequency or the spatial frequencies get smaller and smaller, you actually resolve less and less of that. So there's a problem is that it, your system is not, it's not like a process where I resolve up to a limit and I'm good. There's actually a, as these scales get finer and finer, you resolve them worse and worse. They get blurrier and blurrier, okay? And so this is kind of something that also has to be kept in mind. Now, let's go and throw all of this turbulence into combustion, okay? And let's consider first the case of premixed combustion, where a flame has a propagating weight with velocity scale. Let's consider just two regimes. We have the corrugated flame regimes. Those of you who have taken combustion, you've also taken a turbulent combustion course? All right. So, we have regimes in turbulence, okay? And they can be broken up into these different regimes. Go to Norbert Peters' book. But really, this just tells you how the flame and the turbulence interacts with each other. So I'm going to introduce one where we have corrugated flame. That's all this means is that the flame scale, the thickness, is smaller than the smallest turbulence length scale. Okay? So what we have, if the flame is smaller than the smallest eddies, then the eddies can't penetrate the flame. Okay? But what they can do is they can wrinkle the flame. Okay? And with some manipulation, we can define a scale at this. But let's not, not worry about that. All we can say is, is that the characteristic scale, which is the Skipson scale, is still larger than the Kolmogorov scale. Okay? So that means that all the flame uh, turbulence interaction is taking, care, is taking place at scales larger than the smallest fluid mechanics scales. If we look at another regime that are called the thin reaction zones, where delta F is actually larger uh, than lambda K, but we still don't have a distributed flame. So the eddies can actually uh, interact with the preheat zone. So they get and they broaden kind of the preheat layer, but they don't really mess with the primary reaction layer. When you do this, you get a mixing length scale. Again, not worry about the details, go back and look at it. But again, we point out that the interaction, these scales right here, for these particular regimes dictate the, the scales at which the turbulence and the flame interacts. And they're both larger than the Kolmogorov scale. So what I'm trying to say is for the majority of regimes in premixed turbulent combustion, the interaction will take place at scales larger than the Kolmogorov scale. 
Now, if we go on the non premix combustion, this is not necessarily the case. There's no characteristic velocity scale. It's diffusion control. Uh, everything's sort of response to the fluid uh, dynamics. It's kind of mixing limited as many times what it's uh, referred to. And the interaction between the flow and the chemistry occurs over the entire broad range of scales. Okay? So again, just giving you kind of a background. In premix combustion, they're occurring at slightly larger scales than the smallest length scales. But in non pre combustion, the interaction can occur all the way down at the smallest length scale. Okay? So now let's look at what are some of the sizes of this. You got the general idea that this interaction can happen at large scales. The reason we're looking at this is because in the back of your mind, we've placed over here, there's certain limits on what we can actually resolve. What do we need to resolve? Okay? So in non pre combustion, I've said, okay, we really need to resolve all the way down to the smallest length scale. For premix combustion, we may not have to. So these are just some calculations I did. Uh, let's see, we have a calculation of the Coma Grof scale based on those scaling laws, the one that's 2.3 times uh, Reynolds number to the minus three quarters. So if I choose a certain size of the outer scale, I can generate these different curves. And it, really what I want you to look at these is that I take Reynolds number 10,000, which is kind of a laboratory scale flow. That's not a very turbulent flow. That's kind of like a jet. We would, the lower end of our jet flows. Uh, the Coma Grof scales are at coal, uh, for this size are like 30 microns. And even if we go to a pretty large outer scale, there are a few hundred microns. So we're already a laboratory scale flow at one atmosphere we're already up against kind of the limit of what we can resolve, and I'll show that in a second. Okay? And so if we say, okay, what can be re resolved today? If we have a well-designed experiment, which depends heavily on the hardware, a lot of our scalar measurements can be on the order of one or 200 microns. Typically when we have to induce like an ICCD, we're going to increase quite a bit. MPIV, which we'll tomorrow we'll talk about a lot, uh, is has the worst resolution of all of them. Now, if you look at this, oops, you look at this, this is the best we can do. And these are kind of the smallest sling scales. And maybe we only have to resolve a few times that, depending on what the actual resolution requirements are. We get into some fairly modest flows. I mean, we may be able to get 20, 30, 50, 60 meters a second, but we're not really talking about doing things a couple hundred meters a second or when we get the large scale devices, Reynolds number 100,000, million. I mean, these are realistic systems. Realistic systems have 10 to the 6 Reynolds number. It's just something to keep in mind. Okay, uh, let's see. Keep an eye on the time. I'll skip this one. Let's go to, let's go to this. That's basically, I just, uh, it, it really was the same information. Um, now, can we measure the smallest length scales? Remember, I just estimated them, right, from scaling laws. Those all come from non-reacting turbulence and measurements. So those scaling laws that I showed, the, the 2.3 times Reynolds number to the minus 3 quarters, that's all from non-reacting turbulence scaling laws. They may or may not be applicable, applicable in turbulence. So let's, let's say, can we measure them? Okay. So yes, if the measurements are well resolved, so back to the slide I just skipped, uh, we'll talk about Pope, turbulence theory. First time you take turbulence, get Steve Pope's book or go get it anyway. What happens is turbulence flow, he, he recommends that really turbulent fluctuations, uh, the highest special frequency corresponds to this category where the wave number times the Kolmogorov scale is one. And where it ends up actually corresponding to is about 2% of the total mean dissipation. Okay, keep that in mind. We need to resolve 2% of the mean dissipation. So if we go back to this concept, we can actually measure this in flame. These are measurements from my lab. So many of you may be uh, kind of the power spectral density or the energy spectrum in turbulence. Here's the definition. We basically want to measure the power spectral density of whatever quantity, whether it's velocity fluctuation, te temperature fluctuation. Don't worry about the red curve. Uh, if we look at what the black curve is, this is what an energy spectrum looks like. Then through this, we can determine the dissipation spectrum. 
Okay, we take the dissipation spectrum, and wherever, if your results are resolved well enough, like the black, you actually can find where you get 2% of the dissipation spectrum, and that is your characteristic wave number, and then that can be converted to your measurement resolution. Okay, wait just one over that and get it in the proper units. If you don't have well-resolved units, I mean well-resolved measurements, which is like what this red measurement is, you, you can't measure. So there's kind of a chicken and egg. You need to have really, really well-resolved measurements to determine actually what the smallest length scales are so that you can estimate whether or not you're resolving them. See, it's, a kind, of a, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. But anyway, that's a way that you can measure the smallest length scale. Finally, temporal resolution. We can do our exact same type of scaling arguments. We can get kind of the ratio of these time scales, the Kolmogorov time scale is the smallest time scale, okay? And this outer scale time scale is the largest time scale. If we go through this exact same exercise, we realize that the ratio of the slowest time scale, um, sorry, the time scale, uh, I'm trying to think about, this should be large, yes, compared to a short time scale, goes as Reynolds number uh, to, to the uh, RE delta of the one half. So these are slow, so these are long time scale, these are fast, these are short time scale. So we have a large temporal dynamic range, but it is much more manageable than the spatial dynamic range. The reason why we want to think about this is that there's been a recent explosion of high-speed imaging, excuse me, where we were capturing everyone is now buying a 10 kilohertz laser, 10 kilohertz camera, et cetera, and we want to know whether or not our sampling resolution is, is sufficient. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, what is the shortest time scale? Should it actually be uh, this Kolmogorov time scale? Well, most likely not. Now, if you think about the way we take measurements, is we, we're in an Eulerian frame. So things uh, advect or convect past a pixel, right? We, we have a fixed sensor, we have fixed optics, we're looking at a fixed volume, and things go past it in an Eulerian uh, frame. So really, we should be thinking about a convective time scale. And the convective, the, small, the fastest convective time or the smallest convective time scale should be the, the smallest length scale and the mean velocity convecting past it. And you can see that this convective time scale is much smaller or faster, if you will, than even the Kolmogorov time scale. That's all I want you to get from here. So again, if we want to resolve the fastest motion that's being convected fast, we're going to have to be able to sample very fast. Okay? So let's see how... So that's incredibly intuitive in first glance, right? That's, uh, no. It's, it's basically a chart that you, you want to go stare at for a while. But I, let, me, let me just try to tell you what this means. Basically, you can get a Reynolds number by any combination of a length scale and a convective velocity, right? Okay. So you can have a large Reynolds number by having a very large length scale, or you can have a very large and slow velocity, or you can have a very high velocity and very tiny length scale, and you can still get a large Reynolds number. Okay. But your time scale is only dependent really, well, they're dependent on both, but it becomes much more depend on the convective velocity, right? So you can generate all of these are required acquisition rates for given Reynolds number for certain length and convective velocity. So for example, let's say you could resolve 100 microns, right? And you wanted, with that 100 microns, you also wanted to resolve uh, 500 mi mil meters per second. Well, you go over and look at them and where they fall, well, your required acquisition rate is a megahertz, okay? Well, we don't have too many megahertz systems. So what I said is that your typical commercial laser, you can go to like 20, but just using kind of 10 kilohertz as a measurement, it really kind of shows your limit. If you have a small length scale that you want to resolve, right? We want to, that means that with this 10 kilohertz, we can move all the way down. We can look at flows that are moving at about four meters a second. Not, not very fast, okay? And so that's really all I want to get out of is that if you're trying to look at very small length scales, and let's say you have the spatial resolution to do so, your acquisition rate needs to go up quite a bit to truly resolve that process, okay? Now that's your typical spatial resolution uh, from these measurements, and which is generally better. Another take home message is the spatial resolution from measurements is generally better than our sampling measurement, okay.
And so our lecture summary for this one is that we examine various aspects that determine optical resolution, including the ability to focus a laser. One thing that I want you to really take home is the laser sheet thickness. Your ability to focus laser is primarily limited by the divergence of laser beam, even for high quality lasers. The resolution of your camera system is a function of your optics uh, and of your, your, the, your sensor, your optics, everything. It's not, um, it's not the projected area of the pixel. It's complex function, and in general, the resolution is much worse. But, you know, but it, it, it can be characterized, and you can work hard to get pretty decent resolution. Okay? And uh, finally, for a high Reynolds number of flows, even lab scale flows, even the flows I work in mostly, it it's, can be quite difficult to resolve the length scales. And so this is an important topic in the concept of laser diagnostics in turbulent combustion. Uh, we, there's, we may not always need to resolve the smallest scales, and that's fine. But this creates a more general uh, issue is that for the lean scales that you do need to resolve for the process you're interested in, you need to make sure that your optical system, your diagnostics, is actually resolving those processes. Or there can be significant issues due to the under-resolution of the measurement. Okay, that's it for today. Any questions? Yes? Uh, so the the way I understand it, the point spread function is mostly uh, so if you are just doing a measurement, does that still matter to what your system can do there? Focusing down onto a photodiode. Right, but if you're if you're just focusing on photodiode, it'll only be whatever would be in that photodiode. But if you use any lens or optics to collect, okay. Now your photodiode technically has a point spread function associated with it itself, but that may not, that's not in imaging, right? So if you're just right. taking the laser, then it doesn't matter, okay? Because it doesn't matter if it ends up blurring that and sending it to the, the elements behind it. It still has collected every photon there is. So yeah, that's, it's of no, it's no, no concern. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Sure. So again, and I probably didn't make that clear, when you take whatever measurement of fluctuating quantity and you, met and you determine the energy spectra, the power spectral density, then turn that into the, the dissipative spectra. That, that is a direct measurement. And so if you can resolve 2% of the peak, you have resolved the smallest scale. What will happen is your dissipative will roll off if you're under resolving, due to because you always have noise, so your measurement is always noise is high frequency energy, right? And so your spectra will always roll off. It's just where does it roll off? Does it roll off when you've only resolved 10%? Then you haven't resolved. But if it's down at 1% or less, then you have resolved. Okay. Certainly, come by and well, I'll show I'll show them explain more in detail. If you, any other questions? If not, I'll see you tomorrow. And you are 20% done. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs>